Hello, everyone. Welcome to Strictly Money at the News Forum, where all voices matter. I'm Sajal Patel. Amid a stubbornly high inflation rate, the Bank of Canada has signaled that interest rates are definitely headed up this year. But there are varying views as to the timing and pace of those hikes and how this plays out has implications for prospective home buyers and current mortgage holders. Joining me now with his thoughts is David LaRock, mortgage broker and president of Integrated Mortgage Planners. David, it's great to have you on today. Thanks, Asia. So some economists are calling for four rate hikes by the Bank of Canada. Some think it's going to be one or two. Uh, the central bank itself has signaled that the first hike could be coming March or April. But it's interesting because so many people are now saying, look, it's coming next week. Where do you stand? I don't think we'll see a, a raise next week. We're still in the middle of lockdowns. And the last time that we had lockdowns, we were slashing rates, not raising them. So I think that's, I think there's a lot of um, people competing for headlines now, trying to one up each other with the more outrageous predictions. Uh, uh, Derek Holt at Scotiabank seems to keep upping his bet on the number of rate hikes we'll get this year every time other people come up to where he was previously. I think he's at seven now, seven quarter point hikes this yeah, year. So yeah. um, I, I think there's some headline click bait competition going on. I'm not sure how accurate it will prove. I certainly don't think so. It, it'll be interesting, right? Because um, the central bank doesn't like, or at least the markets don't like surprises from the central bank. And they seem to be communicating properly. But when you have a growing number saying they're going to have to pull the trigger next week, that actually could surprise the markets. Well, definitely the banking Canada is in, a, in an interesting quandary right now because yeah. they've been saying that they don't think they're going to raise until the middle quarters of, of this year. That's been their their, their press uh, commentary. That's what they said in their last monetary policy report. And the last time they, they, they spoke to markets officially in their last policy statement was in December. And they were positive about our economic prospects, about job growth. And, and the Omicron virus was at that point a concern, but... Um, the real impact hadn't yet materialized. So it would be very strange at the next uh, uh, formal communication of the Bank of Canada if um, after we've had um, a rash of uh, infection spikes, uh, hospitals are jammed, we've had lockdowns, um, uh, massive layoffs. Um, uh, I mean, all of the economic data going forward over the short term is going to turn negative and to be hiking into that environment when in December, when things look much more positive, the bank was still planning on waiting until the middle quarters of this year, it would certainly be strange. It would hurt their credibility. Now, there is one X factor here, and this is what the people who think we will see a Bank of Canada rate hike next week um, are, are citing repeatedly, and that is inflation expectations. The Bank of Canada has to be concerned if inflation expectations are going up, that inflation be, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people think prices are going to go up, whether they were or not, if they change their buying behavior and start buying today because they, they fear that prices in the future will be higher, then fear of inflation uh, begets actual inflation. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or, or yeah. some would call it a self-reinforcing cycle. So that is the X factor here. Um, if the Bank of Canada is concerned about inflation expectations becoming, as they say, unanchored, uh, then maybe all bets are off and they have to go ahead. But based on all of their guidance and the fact that things have taken a turn for the worse economically since their last update, I would be very surprised if they hike uh, next week. David, they've also used um, well over a decade um, non-convention Nary, uh, monetary policy as a tool. And what I mean by that is quantitative easy, right? And buying bonds, um, flooding the market with liquidity. How does that factor in um, to managing inflation? And, and is that a tool that they can still lever? Uh, it's it's still a tool. So um, quantitative easing uh, was used at the outset of the pandemic to try to give the economy every possible tailwind uh, uh, that that uh, for the bank wanted to try to give the economy every possible tailwind that it could. And so they started um, uh, buying bonds to lower, well, first to provide liquidity, and then eventually by creating extra demand for bonds, that lowered their yields as well. And because interest rates are priced off of bond yields, um, that caused interest rates to fall. Now, the Bank of Canada has already stopped its quantitative easing. They are no longer 
um, buying uh, incremental bonds in, in the market. Um, what they are doing now is they're in what's called a neutral position. And a neutral position means they've got bonds that are constantly coming up for renewal, existing bonds on their balance sheet. And they, if they didn't replace those bonds, if they allowed those bonds to simply roll off their portfolio, then that would actually be flooding the uh, bond market with more supply. Yeah. And because the Bank of Canada is no longer buying bonds, uh, that would actually cause yields to rise. Welcome back. Um, David, before the break, we were talking about inflationary expectations and where interest rates are headed. So let's talk about how current and prospective homeowners should navigate this. And, and maybe let's start with the new folks, you know, they're looking for homes, if they have the stomach to buy a home right now, or even if they can find a home, should they go fixed or should they go variable? Well, there's no one size fits all answer to that question. Um, I think first time buyers taking on a mortgage payment for the first time are by and large well advised to take a fixed rate. Um, uh, it isn't so much a matter of which will save money over the next five years. It's a matter of getting used to having a lot more expenses and, and, and managing a mortgage and, and house costs and having some certainty over the first five years of, of going through that, I think makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, that said, if you were to ask me, as many borrowers do, which, uh, which option do I think will save money over the next five years? Um, I think I'm in the minority at this point. I still believe that variable rates will save money over fixed rates over the next five years for two reasons. First of all, I think the Bank of Canada will raise uh, more slowly and by less than the market consensus believes. Um, we talked about why I think the bank isn't going to start raising next week. Uh, but even in what it does raise, if you read what the Bank of Canada themselves have said, um, they say that they don't think they'll have to raise by as much as they've had to in past cycles to bring inflation to heel because we have record debt levels outstanding. So each rate hike, the impact of each rate hike will be magnified by record, record high uh, debt levels, both at the government and uh, household level. Um, now, when the Bank of Canada does start to raise, if you're in a variable rate today, you've got a, a gap of anywhere from one and a quarter to one and a half percent between the best fixed rates and best variable rates you can get today. So that's a pretty significant margin of safety. And also, Point two, even if I'm wrong and the Bank of Canada does raise rapidly, there are a lot of people out there who think if the Bank of Canada hikes, does five, four, five, six, seven quarter point hikes in the next 12 months, when you look at what the bond market is pricing in, they're also pricing in rate cuts in 2024, because if we hike that much, that quickly, we're almost certain to get a recession. And when we get a recession, rates fall and the Bank of Canada cuts. Mm. So if you're talking about fixed versus variable over the next five years, there's a lot of attention being paid to what might happen over the next 12 to 18 months. But if I'm wrong and we get more rate hikes over the next 12 to 18 months than I think we'll get, I think there'll be cuts of waiting on the other side. And again, when you average it out over five years, I think variable rates, there's a compelling case. And I go into a lot of detail in my blog about why I think that beyond just the points I'm making now. Um, uh, but I think variable rates will save money over fixed rates over the next five years. Um, I should add my opinion in two bucks will get you a hot cup of coffee. <laughs> but I, I put a lot of time into researching this topic and um, been doing it for a decade now. Um, and yeah, I think if you have the stomach for it, I think variable rates will prove cheaper. So David, uh, for current homeowners, you know, I keep hearing, oh, they're going to be in trouble when rates go up. And, and personally, to me, that doesn't quite make sense because unless you're renewing, say, next year, um, you have a window of time, don't you? Like, what, what am I missing here? Well, there's no question that if rates are higher at renewal, that people will feel a bit of a pinch in their pocketbook. But anybody renewing a mortgage now or getting a mortgage now is qualifying at the stress test rate, which has always been in about the 5% range. Right. So you can't get a mortgage today unless you prove that based on 50 years worth of uh, lender lending data, that you can afford for rates to go to 5%. So if we're talking about rates going from 2% to 2.5% or 3%, there's no question that that will be a hit. In, in a borrower's pocketbook, but uh, we won't be seeing foreclosure signs and people being put out of house and home um, if, if rates go up by half a percent or a percent. Because again, the stress test, which was put in place years ago, um, uh, was designed to protect people and protect the market um, from destabilization risks, and it's done its job. 
We have uh, about a minute um, before we go to commercial break. David, can you just clarify something? If you're in a variable, right, does your actual payment go up or does it say the same and the amount towards the principal goes down? Because I, I hear mixed uh, stories about this. Well, there's a reason why. There's two kinds of variable rate mortgages. There's one kind where every time the prime rate changes, your payment uh, changes. So okay. if there's a quarter point increase, your payment goes up. But there's another kind of variable rate mortgage where your payment doesn't go up and your amortization extends. So you keep paying the same amount, but because the interest rate has gone up, it's going to take you longer if you only make the minimum payment to actually pay off the mortgage over time. There are two different types of variable rate mortgages. And in industry lingo, one is called an adjustable mortgage and the other is called a variable rate. But in the in the consumer world, they're both variable rates. Okay. That's an important clarification, though, for borrowers to ask whoever's advising them which one they're getting. All right, good and uh, and noted. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, I want to get your thoughts on home affordability. Welcome back to Strictly Money. My guest this show is mortgage broker, David LaRock. Um, David, I want to switch the conversation to home affordability. Um, everything under the sun has been suggested. Uh, surtax, increasing supply, vacancy tax, banning foreign ownership. Um, I want to talk about a lot of these uh, with you. But if there's one thing that policymakers can do right now that's, that's easy enough to implement and that could have an immediate impact, what do you think they should do? Well, that is the million dollar question these days. Um, uh, first of all, I don't think anything that makes it easier or cheaper to buy a house will help at all. That is, in my opinion, pouring more gas on the fire. And ultimately, if you create a special provision that makes it easier, for example, for first time home buyers to qualify, uh, then uh, that'll help affordability for about 24 hours. And then after that, prices will go up even higher. And, uh, and that and that advantage will quickly go away. So I don't think there are any, any uh, loosening demand or coming up with more generous provisions for buyers, uh, uh, special tax accounts or bigger RSP withdrawals. I don't think any of that is going to do anything for affordability. The issues really right now are, are, are of supply. We just don't have a lot of inventory in the market. In a healthy balanced market, we should have three to four months worth of inventory. Right now, we've got less than a month in the GTA available. And that supply to balance, uh, so supply demand imbalance is causing prices to skyrocket. I think the biggest change we could make over the very short term, obviously increasing supply over the long term uh, is, is the long term solution, but that will take a long time. Uh, I think over the short term, right now, the thing I noticed as a mortgage broker 10 years ago, when people were moving up, they were moving, selling their condo and buying a house or selling their small house and buying a bigger house. They did a buy and a sell. And today, everybody starts the conversation the same way. They want to figure out how to keep their existing property and move up to the, to the, uh, the, the new bigger property. And over time, with many thousands of people, what that does is it means that lots of people own two properties and fewer people own one property. So you have lots of zeros and lots of twos. Um, and in terms of demand, the Bank of Canada has just done a study and it shows that since the pandemic started, the biggest difference is, is that, is that uh, more people are becoming property investors. Um, I'm not trying to vilify property investors. Uh, um, they provide uh, an important, uh, um, uh, they, are, they contribute importantly to the overall housing market, but there's an imbalance right now and tighter rules for uh, rental property investing um, would, would limit some of that activity and put more supply back on the market for uh, newer buyers and for buyers of uh, uh, the, the lower priced housing. So you don't think the vacancy tax would work, right? I, I understand they've introduced a 1% one, uh, 1 annual tax on the value of the home. Um, it doesn't seem very punitive. I have called for a vacancy tax and I think it makes perfect sense. Um, if you have a problem, you tax the problem and you use the revenue to put towards the solution. If we're going to uh, create a vacancy tax and direct those funds toward increasing housing supply. I think that's a no brainer. The challenge is how will it be enforced? People find all kinds of ways to get around rules like that. And the real proof of that pudding will be in the eating as always. So like the idea, but um, uh, I'm going to remain a bit skeptical until we see how it's being implemented. How big of an issue is money laundering, David? 
I don't think it's having a huge impact on the overall market, but I think it's a very dangerous political issue because obviously money laundering is a huge concern. It's patently, it's patently unfair. Um, we've had a lot of shocking articles published about uh, money laundering being uncovered. It seems like our regulators have been asleep at the switch. It seems like our political masters have been asleep at the switch. So um, I think there's a lot of political risk right now if they don't get on top of the money laundering file and address the issue. Um, but Quite simply, in terms of overall affordability in the market, I don't think it's one of the main contributors, but it's certainly something we should clean up um, uh, for uh, politically, if not uh, uh, because it'll have a huge impact on the overall market. Okay. We have about 45 seconds to the commercial break. Um, there is a saying that high prices cures high prices. Do you buy, do you buy that? Eventually, yes. I do think that higher prices will limit the number of people who can buy, and eventually uh, the, the cure for higher prices will be higher prices, absolutely. Uh, but it's painful for that process to play out, and in the meantime, we're losing a lot of talent, younger people, to other parts of the country, and that's heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah you can see here, the, uh, what was it, the average home price just um, since COVID has gone up 30%. Okay, we're going to take a, an, another break, and I want to continue this conversation and get your thoughts on the proposed surtax of homes over a, a million dollars, because that's been quite controversial and, and in the news in the last week. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Strictly Money. Um, David, I want to get your thoughts on this surtax that uh, has been proposed on homes that are over a million dollars. Uh, Nima Rajan is an anchor here um, for the News, uh, News Daily or the Forum Daily, and, and she actually interviewed the professor who's authored this and has proposed this. So I'm going to play a clip uh, for you, and I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, whether you're worried about reducing housing unaffordability or wealth inequality, we're saying it's time to protect real shelters much more so than tax shelters. And your listeners might be wondering, what do you mean by a tax shelter? So for anyone who went to work today, 100% of their earnings is going to be subject to tax. If people use some of those earnings to invest in the stock market, 50% of their return on investment from the stock market would be subject to tax. But for anyone who's a homeowner like me, who has their wealth in their homes go up, barely any of that wealth is ever subject to tax. And the moment our policies turn our housing system into a strategy by which people can think, hey, I can get a really good return on investment that I shelter from taxation, we entangle everyday Canadians to bank on high and rising home, uh, home prices for their wealth accumulation strategies. And that inclines us to be happy and hopeful that home prices will continue to rise and leave earnings behind. But by definition, we then bake in unaffordability for those who follow in our footsteps. And so this tax is trying to disrupt that way in which we entangle Canadians in hoping home prices will continue to rise and rise above a million bucks. David, does he have a point? Because so many people are banking on their homes for their retirement strategy, wealth accumulation. Could this solve this? I think he definitely has a point. There's no question right now the the gap between the wealth gap between people who own houses and people who don't own houses is widening, and there's a fundamental lack of fairness to that. Um, uh, the sad reality is, last year a lot of homeowners made more on their house than they did by getting up in the morning and going to work every day. And and not only is that fundamentally unfair to people who don't own homes, it's also I think a lot of us can accept intuitively that that just doesn't, that's not a healthy economic environment. Um, the question, I guess, is, is what that surtax is really supposed to achieve. I think from a fairness standpoint and from a political standpoint, it has merit. Um, I don't think it would have a big impact on affordability, certainly not over the short term. So I think the key really is to define what the objective is and to make sure that it's, it's for the former and not for the latter, because I think it would be much more effective politically and from an overall fairness standpoint. Um, and uh, I know it's a third rail in politics, and uh, um, uh, a lot of people are probably afraid to give an honest answer about that. But yeah, I mean, I, I see his point. David, what's your advice for people who are looking for homes right now? Should they just avoid it? There, there's still a lot of FOMO out there. Well, 
here's the challenge. I bought my first house in 2003 and I was convinced when I bought that the housing market was overvalued and I was buying at the peak. And I did it anyway, because at the stage of life that I was at, it was the time when I wanted to buy a house and I could afford to do it. So it's tough to know without a crystal ball, what the future will hold. Um, but the, the advice I give uh, any buyer now more than ever is do your planning up front, set your budget, figure out how much you can afford, what you're going to spend. Don't let the emotion of an offer night when you're competing with a whole bunch of other bidders carry you away. Because ultimately, um, there's there's too much emotion uh, in the competitive bidding process. People don't make their best decisions when those things happen. So the people that I speak to um, who are planning ahead know going in, this is what things will cost. This is the most I can afford. This is what I'm comfortable with. And everything is laid out before offer night so that if you get caught up in the emotion of offer night and you have a hard limit and that's your walk away, then uh, you're not trying to make a decision in that moment. You made your decision that morning before you showed up on offer night and you stick to it. We have about 30 seconds left. Uh, David, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Which light are we talking about? Is it, is it sunlight <laughs> or is it a yeah. train coming <laughs> towards us at high speed? I, 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 there's definitely a light coming, but I'm not sure which it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, housing affordability, you think it'll work its way through? And how long will it take? Well, Sejal, I'd go back to the quote that you made, which is, I do think that the cure for high prices will be high prices. That's that. If nothing else, I think that will be the cure. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your insight. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. David LaRock, president of Integrated Mortgage Planners.